Cats population is getting out of hand So we're planning a war in space We've got to keep them in control and under our command We're planning a war in space Ever since we learned the atom could be split and used to kill We know if we don't build the bomb some other bastards will We know because we spy upon them all from men with ill Planning a war in space so thanks for joining us everyone. Um, I hope you're all keeping safe and well. Uh, I know there's a lot of excellent webinars and videos and stuff going on at the moment and at uh, this time. So in case you've joined the wrong one, we're about to start this one on War in Space, Weaponizing the Final Frontier. And it's a joint webinar from Yorkshire CND and the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. So I'm Dave Webb and I'm Chair of CND in Britain and Convener of the Global Network. And we have with us today two other panel members, Linda Williams, who's there somewhere, right, waving, an activist and science educator from San Francisco in California. And she's on the board of the Global Network and Bruce Gagnon, the Convener of the Global Network from, from Maine in the United States. So we're spanning a few thousand miles here, and I know many of you are from uh, far away, so thanks for joining. And sorry about the um, little glitches at the beginning, but uh, we're learning how to do this as we go, well, some of us are anyway, as we go along. So more from uh, those two other panelists uh, in a moment. Um, the three of us will be talking for about 10 to 15 minutes each, and then it will be over to you for comments and questions. And the total time we've kind of thought that this would last for is about one and a half hours. So if you're joining us on Zoom, then you can submit your comments and questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you're watching this live on Facebook, then just add a comment on the Facebook page and it will be re relayed to us uh, here. This is the first of a possible webinar series and I apologize to people living on the other side of the world. We just heard that it's 3 a.m. in Australia, and uh, it's probably around that time too in Japan or South Korea. So uh, sorry about that. Uh, we hope to do some future webinars which may fit better in with those time zones, I think. So um, look out for that. With an eye on possible future events, we've constructed a poll which will help us plan what to do next. It should appear on your screen soon so please and there it is i think could you fill that in uh, click on the re relevant uh, buttons and submit at, at the bottom of the uh, poll there uh, so we've got some idea of where you're coming from and what topics you might be interested in for to help us with the future so i want to first give a short background to why the militarization of space is something to be concerned about and I recognize that some of you may know a lot of this already, but some won't. And we want to encourage everyone to find out more and to actually get involved. So I've got a little presentation here, which um, I want to be able to show if I can work this out. Hold on a moment. Share my screen. I think it's that one there. Okay, can you see that? Okay. Yep. Right. So, um, I've lost my script. So, on December the 20th last year, President Trump authorized a record defense budget of $738 billion. Not only did he allocate $71 billion for overseas contingency operations, i.e., war but he also established the Space Force as the sixth branch of the US Armed Forces. Trump called this a big moment and added that there was going to be a lot of things happening in space because space is the world's newest warfighter. The US Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper, was also quoted as saying that maintaining American dominance in that domain is now the mission of the United States Space Force. These actions and statements are causing widespread concern and a Chinese foreign ministry spokesman
called the authorization of Space Force a serious violation of the international consensus on the peaceful uses of outer space. And other nations are also joining this new space race. Russia, China and India have had extensive military space programs for some time. But last July, President Macron declared that France had allocated 3.6 billion euros to its own military space force to, to take warfighting into space. The following week, Penny Mordaunt, the UK Defence Minister Secretary at the time, outlined a new 30 million pound space programme for the Ministry of Defence involving the development of small satellites. Mordaunt also announced that today we show, we show the sky is no longer the limit for our armed forces and that Joint Forces Command will become Strategic Command and will coordinate war fighting in the, in the air, on land, at sea and in the cyberspace domains. NATO is also participating and the London summit in December announced that it too would be developing a policy for war fighting in space. Japan too is putting our space force together and others are more likely, are more than likely to follow. The Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space has been campaigning against these developments and related issues since 1992. It was founded following a series of campaigns against the use of nuclear materials to power spacecraft. The risks of explosive launch fa failures and unintended burn-ups in the atmosphere during flybys or close approaches had led to some concern about the possible spread of plutonium in the atmosphere. Several plutonium carrying spacecraft had already failed and resulted in nuclear contam contamination across the planet. The global network was set up by the joint efforts of the Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice, Citizens for Peace in Space in Colorado Springs, and New York based journalism professor Carl Grossman. In 1998, Bruce Gagnon began serving as coordinator of the Global Network, which is now governed by a board of directors, which is elected at its general membership meetings. The board of directors is also assisted by a board of advisors. I think we have a number of members of our board here today, and I would like to ask uh, a couple of them, if, if they're available, to say a few words. So, we have uh, Professor Carl Grossman, one of the founder members. Carl, in, in two minutes, can you give us your thoughts on the importance of this um, campaign? Can we unmute Carl? There we go. I think you're still muted. Can can uh, unmute, start oh, video. Here we go. Here we go. Press. Off to go ahead, a. Go ahead, Carl. You can hear me, David. Yep, yep. Yeah. Well, uh, what we've been fearing for for decades, uh, what was um, being in fact prepared for decades with the U.S. Space Command and reports like Vision for 2020, uh, talking about the U.S. Uh, uh, dominating space and from space, dominating the planet below uh, has, has all been coming together now under uh, uh, this person, Trump, the U.S. president. Uh, this all importantly is, uh, well, despite the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which uh, declares space a global commons, peaceful purposes. Uh, so this is the time, like no time before, uh, that um, uh, well, how important the work of the global network has been. Uh, the global network now is, as, as the leading international organization, challenging uh, turning the heavens into a war zone. Uh, it's a critical point. The global network is critical. This must be stopped because... Um, uh, if it isn't uh, other nations, surely you just saw a slide about uh, England and and uh, uh, and France moving up into space uh, uh, militarily. 
uh, there'll be Pakistan, there'll be India, nation after nation, and uh, uh, space will become a, a new battleground. It's critical that from the grassroots, and that's what the global network represents, uh, this, uh, this insanity be stopped. Thank you, Carl. Thanks very much. Thanks for all your work. Brilliant. So I'm, I'm not sure whether we have Regina Hagen on uh, the list of uh, attendees, but sh she was one of the key organizers back in the early days and uh, organized two of the very early annual meetings of the Global Network in Darmstadt in Germany. Um, can anybody see her name on there? I I'm not sure she's joined us. But uh, anyway, thanks to you, Regina, for your work too. As for me, I first uh, got involved in 1998 when a small group of people from Citizens for Peace in Space in Colorado Springs visited us in Yorkshire in the north of England to link up with the campaign against Menwith Hill, the huge US spy base near where I live. Colorado Springs is where major parts of the US Space Command were and still are located. For some years previously, we in Yorkshire had been informed about Menwith Hill by the Otley Peace Action Group, a local peace group that had been attending meetings around the region to spread information about the base and its important role for US surveillance and electronic spying. But the US activists were then able to explain how this fits into the global surveillance system of the US and it really opened our eyes. And since then Menwith Hill and nearby Filingdales a large powerful US radar used for satellite tracking and missile defense have been central parts of our campaigning. Both bases are designated as RAF, but we are aware that <clears throat> both were built and used predominantly by the US. Yorkshire CND has been helping the campaigns against these two bases, working with the Men with Hill Accountability Campaign and its predecessor, the Campaign for the Accountability of American Bases. The role of the bases and the many, other, many others like them around the world comes originally from the Second World War, then the space race of the Cold War and was given some focus by the famous 1983 Star Wars speech of Ronald Reagan. In his speech, Reagan introduced the, his uh, Strategic Defense Initiative or SDI and the ideas following from that were later st stimulated by the collapse of the Soviet Union. The aerospace corporations were provided with bucket loads of money and much encouragement to come up with all kinds of schemes for space-based weapons. Although it soon became clear that the SDI could not provide complete protection from a nuclear attack, the corporations had been busy presenting the ideas of a technology-led global dominance to the military and to politicians from all parties and that stays with us today. So the idea of full protection against nuclear attack had given way to protection from a limited attack against so-called rogue states and even terrorist groups. And so the development of missile defense systems remained on the cards and in 2002 President George W. Bush withdrew the US from the anti-ballistic missile treaty with Russia. This had been set up in 1972 it had been established then in recognition that the arms race would be accelerated by anti-ballistic missile systems, which might provoke a first strike against any nation fielding them. On leaving this 30-year-old treaty, George W. Bush immediately started to construct and deploy a new ground-based missile defense system. Since then, land and sea-based systems have been deployed in the US, in Europe, and in East Asia and the Pacific by Bush and Barack Obama. And now Donald Trump is considering the possibility of space-based interceptors. More about all this later though. Meanwhile, the US had become convinced that it needed to control and dominate the space environment. And the 1991 Gulf War, the 1999 conflicts in Kosovo, Afghanistan in 2001, and Iraq in 2003, all became proving grounds for military space technolo technologies. And in 1997, the Space Command, US Space Command developed and published its vision for 2020, which Carl mentioned earlier, which proclaimed that 
so important are space systems to military operations that it's unrealistic to imagine that they will never become targets. It also recognized and accepted the growing division between the global economic haves and have nots and introduced the doctrine of full spectrum dominance, the military domination of the land, sea, air, space, and information to protect the interests of the haves. To be able to project power across the world and achieve its ultimate goal, the US military has established over the years a network of ground-based stations to communicate with its satellites at all times and relay information to and from command centers. There are stations for tracking satellites and other space objects to determine what others are up to in space, for electronic spying, information hacking, interception to determine what others are up to on the ground, and various cyber warfare activities to interfere and hamper with the activities of others. Satellite communications networks have been set up for the command and control of everything, everywhere, at any time. Missile defense systems are being established in an attempt to deny retaliation and thereby enable a first strike. And also, of course, drones controlled through satellite links are used for surveillance and piloted remotely to spy and deliver death from thousands of miles away. Hypersonic intercontinental cruise missiles are being developed for missile defense and prompt global strike as are secret unmanned space planes and new space weapons projects are underway. So that's a kind of a sketch of the context and a bit about our background. There are, of course, lots of individuals and groups around the world who are resisting these things. People who are involved in local or national campaigns, perhaps focusing on specific parts of the military industrial complex or the political system. People who want to keep space for peace. And I'd like to introduce again one of those people, Linda Williams, who's been a member of the board of the Global Network for some time. I'll just stop sharing my screen. Um, <coughs> Uh, she's recently been involved in the campaign to stop the installation of a missile defense radar in Hawaii. So can you tell us more about that, Linda? Hi, let me share my self. Hi, everybody. Okay, sorry. Hello. I had to go to the bathroom. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, I have a presentation to share, so I'll start with that so we can get to Q&A. Um, and so let me share my screen. Okay. All right. Can you see my screen, everybody? Yep. Yeah? Yep. Okay, good. I like feedback. All right. So my name's Linda Williams, and I'm a member of the Global Network now for almost over 20 years. I'm a physicist, and I teach at Santa Rosa Junior College. And there's my contact information. By the way, we're, we are recording this, so you can watch it later. And we can share our PowerPoints on the Global Network website. My stage name is also Linda Lovon. The Lovon is the particle of love, like the photon and the boson. We got the love on. We need more love in this world. I live in Northern California, which is Pomo Coastal Miwok territory. Um, my first love is performance, and my performance has always been involved with uh, the future evolution of the planet and um, bringing science to the people for political empowerment. My whole goal is scientific literacy for political empowerment. I also love sailing and do planetarium shows. I did a planetarium show on Polynesian wayfinding, and that's kind of how I fell in love with Hawaii and started doing some actions there with um, the local native communities. Um, I also do work on radioactivity and I was first and foremost an anti-nuclear activist. In fact, I started off as an entertainer but then became impassioned after seeing Helen Caldicott speak about nuclear weapons 30 years ago and decided to study physics and learned I was actually pretty good at it. 
Um, and so now I'm a physicist, but first and foremost, I'm a entertainer, performance artist, singer, songwriter, peace activist. And so I got involved with the Global Network 20 years ago. And some of the projects that, that I focus on is um, keeping space for peace, space ecology, because we're trashing space, and then um, demilitarizing um, Hawaii and other colonized areas. I also do some writing about space ecology. It's the final frontier of environmentalism. And this is like recently, we did have some success with um, postponing of a $2 billion radar system that the Pentagon and Missile Defense Agency wanted to build in Hawaii. And that's only been postponed because it's not in the current budget, but uh, the senators from Hawaii are trying to put it back in because they like the pork. So the battle's not over, but um, we're still working on that, but it is a minor success. And we can talk about that later during Q&A and discussion because I really think what's happening is they just realize these land-based systems don't work and they're going to put the sensor array in space. So they kind of just skipped it, but local politicians want it to be built because of the money that comes into the region. So same, I don't know, um, when I saw in 1999, this booklet, Vision for 2020, um, and I saw the images that were put forward, this one blew my mind, right? Uh, space-based laser weapons, they're not fighting in space, they're fighting targets on Earth, and you can see that looks like Iran or Iraq in there somewhere. Um, this horrified me, and I joined the Global Network after that. But I want to start off because first and foremost, I'm a well, I would sing it. Uh, I want to just say, what is space? We talk about space. We talk about war in space. And I want to get some space perspective. So uh, here's our beautiful planet, Mother Earth spaceship and our satellite, the moon. Now, we typically think, you know, uh, space as being circumterrestrial around Earth itself. Legally, it's defined to be at the Karaman line, which is about 100 kilometers or 62 miles above Earth sea level where there's a diminished atmosphere. So you can see the different layers of, um, I'm gonna use my laser pointer so you can see my laser pointer. We've got the troposphere and the stratosphere going on up and then this is considered to be space. But I'd like to take a more broader view about what space is because we are on this amazing spaceship orbiting a star, our sun, which is a nuclear furnace that radiates light and gives us life. And this is the local space, but we're part of a broader space. We're part of a planetary system of planets that orbit the star. But the star isn't motionless. No, the star is actually moving through the galaxy. And this is a more interesting perspective, not completely accurate, but it's a very dynamic spaceship we're on. We feel like we're stationary, but it's an illusion. Quite frankly, not only are we orbiting a star that's orbiting a galaxy, we're moving in and out of the galactic plane in this oscillatory motion going through denser regions and then less dense regions orbiting every 225 million years. So you see that classic picture of you are here in the galaxy just to get a galactic perspective. But that's not it, friends. We're part of a cluster of galaxies. There's billions of galaxies and when you look out into what's called the Hubble Deep Field, you see clusters of galaxies. So when you get this perspective, you could see not only, I, I, I really don't like it when people say like, oh, you know, this picture shows us how uh, meaningless our planet is. It's like, no, I think it's just the opposite. How rare and special our planet is that can sustain such diverse and wonderful life and culture. So look at, I mean, these are clusters of galaxies and we are but in one galaxy on this special earth that has life and we're having this freaking Zoom meeting right now. It's amazing. And space itself was created according to science from the Big Bang um, when there was a certain level of nothingness that exploded and created all space time with it and all the manifest uh, particles uh, that we have emerged from. And we're still expanding today. So that, that's a more, um, you know, universal perspective of what space is. But in terms of war in space, we're talking about circumterrestrial space. 
And that's typically moving around Earth in low orbit or even higher orbits. And there's all kinds of different orbits, but particularly we're talking about where we put our space assets and the space assets are satellites. And this isn't accurate anymore because SpaceX has, you know, launched hundreds. Uh, I don't even know what it's up to now. It might be a thousand satellites in their Starlink satellite network. Um, Elon Musk is now the single largest owner of satellites in around Earth right now. Why war in space? Well, as Dave already introduced, the history is that the space race began with Sputnik. So we've been putting stuff and fighting over territory like humans tend to do, uh, entrenched in the patriarchy of capitalism. Um, but we know that space is the ultimate high ground. So if you can control the moon, you can control all launches on Earth. If you can control the space around Earth, then you can control Earth. And that's militarily the objective. We also are facing, you know, you hear about the gold rush in space. So um, gold rush in space, mining space, gold rush in space. We're going to go out there. We're going to get those saddle, uh, get those asteroids and um, mine them for all the, you know, platinum and gold and all the minerals that are worth so much money. And people say that trillionaires are going to be made in space as if that's a good thing. Now, I mean, we got billionaires and they're creating so much mischief and misery on this planet. Can you imagine when they become trillionaires? Well, that's what they promised. The trillionaires await. Who's going to profit from that? These guys profit from that primarily aerospace industries and resource extraction industries. We hear this manifest destiny hype. Humanity must migrate to the stars and colonize space to save the human species, question mark. Well, that's what they said to justify colonialism on Earth. And um, this idea that we're gonna have space colonies and colonize Mars as some way of saving humanity is probably one of the biggest lies perpetrated by the war machine and capitalism that I've ever heard. And who's gonna profit from that? These guys. Let's just face it. Colonialism and the gold rush didn't fare so well for millions and millions of people on our planet. So I find it quite ignorant that they are even using the terminology gold rush. You know what I mean? For going into space, it's, it's horrific. So we still have ongoing violence on earth over extraction of oil, gas, gold, diamonds, conflict minerals, and that includes you know, pipelines as well. So mining in space could cause new war in space. So that's clearly one reason why we want to militarize and weaponize space. I mean, space is already militarized. We want to weaponize it so that we can control the assets for money making. Who's going to profit? Same people. Another reason that it's justified is because we say we're going to defend against nuclear threats. I know I'm doing this giant data dump on you all right now, and you can go over it later. We can talk about it, but um, only have 15 minutes. So, But yeah, another idea is that we can defend from nuclear weapon threat. And so we have missile defense. Now, missile defense was launched after we withdrew from the anti-ballistic missile treaty, as Dave already spoke about. But missile defense is kind of like, it's a step into going to space, right? They, we're gonna start on the planet and do this missile defense that it can ultimately reach space. Um, and here's why you'll see in a moment. So uh, right now we've spent over a hundred billion dollars since we withdrew from the anti-ballistic missile treaty that we know of installing missile defense systems around the planet. And here's just some of them. Um, the basic idea is that if an enemy launches a nuclear weapon that we can take it out. And there's many different systems to do that. Well, there's essentially four different systems that we have right now to, to do this. And that's a whole nother talk. But the main one is the, that we put the most money into is ground-based mid-course missile defense, GMD. And the idea is if an enemy launches a missile, right? So it launches it and it goes into space and then drops back down to earth, right? And Ballistic just means that it's moving on its own inertia, that there isn't like a guidance system for um, these kind of weapons. So you uh, launch from, we have these interceptors in Vandenberg in California and Fort Greeley in Alaska, and that's it right now. So we, and they're very, very expensive for each interceptor. And the idea is to uh, take out the nuclear weapon in space. But guess what? Blowing up a nuclear weapon in space, not good for space, not good for Earth. We know from the uh, nuclear weapons test that we did back in 1962 when they did Starfish Prime where they detonated a nuclear weapon um, above Hawaii 
and above Johnson Island in the Pacific. And that took out all of the satellite, not all of them, but many of the satellites we had at the time. So we know that the electromagnetic pulse and the radiation emitted from a nuclear detonation in space is catastrophic for satellite assets. And so after this, after this test, then they, um, the world got together and said, well, no more testing in space. And they had a limited test ban treaty to um, prevent this because everyone knew we were going to develop um, space with satellites for telecom and business and warfare. So they stopped that. Even so, knowing that detonating nuclear weapons in space would be so catastrophic for our space assets, they still um, went to develop these ground-based missiles. So we only have 44 ground-based interceptors, which is absolutely obscene. I mean, bizarre, because there's how many nuclear weapons? You know, yeah, 12,000 nuclear weapons, 17,000, 8,000. I don't know. It's like enough overkill to kill the biosphere many times over. So we only got 44 shots to take them out. Crazy. Um, another, now they're doing this layered missile defense where, so I, my point being that this is war in space. These ground-based missile defense, they, they are built and made to detonate and blow up, intercept uh, nuclear weapons in space. So we're already developing war in space. They're just from ground-based interceptors. Other methods is this layered defense. You could have Aegis, so you have interceptors from ships, or you could have these THADs. We got THADs in all over Europe. We've got them in South Korea. PAC is an army thing. Um, I'm not really into this tech, but I have to do it anyway. So Aegis Ashore has been brought into uh, Japan, just bought a couple of these. They want to put them in Guam, and um, they have one in uh, Hawaii, on Kauai at the Pacific Missile Range Facility. So uh, here you go. So this is the idea. And they do the testing all the time. So they've been testing. They launched from Vandenberg. And then, I mean, they launched the fake uh, missile from Kwajalein in the Marshall Islands. And then uh, the interceptors launched from Vandenberg. But the tests are all faked because, um, for one thing, they don't use um, any kind of um, uh, real case scenarios where they might have um, decoys. And so, uh, you know, they know what the coordinates are. Um, it's all faked, and then they say that it works. And um, missile defense, if you want to learn more about it, go to Union of Concerned Scientists, and they have completely deconstructed why missile defense doesn't work and will never work. Aegis Navy ships, there's 33 in the Pacific, eight in Hawaii. They're $42 billion each. Just let that hang with you for a minute. Aegis Ashore is $2.5 billion each. And like I said, Japan just bought two of them. Um, yeah, ugh. Thad in Hawaii, they're three billion dollars each. They're cheaper. Thad's only intended for so you know going back to this picture here, which is kind of like gives you the sense here. So the idea is that you could um, the um, ocean-based Aegis interceptors can launch from space and should be able to hit in orbit. So they are can, or they have a long range. The Thad is short range, and the Pack, which is the Army interceptor, is even shorter range. So you're hoping the layered idea is that you have ground base to try to get it in space, or if they can't, then maybe the Aegis can, and if they can't, then Thad, Pack. You got all these different layered, spending hundreds of billions of dollars to try to knock out um, nuclear weapons. So we've also spent billions of dollars on radar systems don't that don't work. So this floating golf ball in the Pacific doesn't work at all. And just on April 2nd, the Pentagon has proposed spending $20 billion during a pandemic to try to expand missile defense in Guam and in the Pacific. Who profits? These guys. So where did this really get started? It wasn't just with, uh, you know, um, Trump or uh, Bush started by pulling out of the ABM treaty and then Obama in 2016, he signs the, you know, he signs a bill that spurs, you know, the development of a space-based missile defense. So they're like, they know it doesn't work on Earth, so let's put it into space. All right, so, ah, then comes Trump. I love that, it's from, that image is from Der Spiegel. Um, and he launches Space Force, which was inevitable. And all of this, even if he hadn't developed Space Force, was just seems to be like a reorg you know, they're taking all the space assets from the different branches of the military and putting it into Space Force. Can, still you, get going? Can you wind up? Yeah, wind up? yeah, yeah. Phase one. I'm almost done. We're going to put a space-based laser in, uh, 
you know, hundreds, if not thousands of satellites in space for detecting missiles. It'll cost hundreds, millions, billions of dollars. Phase two, space-based weapons. Hypersonics, which they just the other day proposed spending uh, $20 billion on hypersonics. Who profits? They profit. So here's my final little thing. It took, I like this little cartoon. We don't want this. It took some doing, but thank God in the Pentagon, we Americans now at long last 100% safe from foreign attack, right? But there we are, no hospitals, no jobs, public schools. Again, it's bad for space. We're trashing space. They've been doing ASAT tests. Um, there's risk of collision. We've been trashing space. Uh, all This is what is happening to our beautiful planet. As Carl mentioned, space is a common ground. It's a, it's a tragedy of the commons. This is a common space we all share together. We could have some treaties in space. Paros has been proposed for uh, decades now. It's a prevention of an arms race in outer space. And so we know it's early in this. What kind of future do we want? Well, if we have a planetary awareness and we start thinking about space as an environment to preserve and conserve, maybe we can prevent war in space. Because I'm with her, and this is our spaceship, one island in an ocean from space. We're all astronauts, so we have to take care of our space because our scientific power has outrun our spiritual power. We have guided missiles and unguided men. So please join us, the Global Network. Boom. Great, thank you very much, Linda. Thank you. Yes, we stop sharing. So, so we okay. we have uh, we have some questions coming in, and we'll we will uh, attend to those uh, a little bit later on. But first, I'd like to ask Bruce Gagnon, coordinator of the Global Network, to say a few words. Bruce, there was one item last Tuesday that Moscow and Washington have agreed to the creation of a working group in space. Do you have any comment on that? I mean, do you think it's likely to be useful? Well, I think it's a good idea anytime the United States talks with any other country, particularly Russia and China. You know, for the last many, 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 many years, well over 20 or more years, every year Russia and China have gone to the United Nations introducing a new treaty because the old treaties, the Outer Space Treaty, the Moon Treaty, are really outdated technologically. And so new treaties are needed to bring in these new uh, weapons technologies that are being developed for space. And so every year, uh, Russia and China have introduced this treaty called PAROS, P-A-R-O-S, Prevention of an Arms Race in Outer Space. And it always passes overwhelmingly in the UN General Assembly in New York, usually just the United States and Israel now and then maybe the Marshall Islands or Ukraine have been brought in to uh, also vote no on it, but it passes overwhelmingly. And then it goes to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva for negotiation. And it is there that the US and Israel really block it. And the US position through Republican and Democrat administrations alike has been that, hey, there's no problem. There are no weapons in space. We don't need a new treaty. But that's the aerospace industry talking. And since the US has begun this encirclement of Russia and China with these so-called missile defense systems that Dave and Linda, I think, have explained pretty well, key elements in US first strike attack planning. Uh, since the US has been doing this, uh, Russia and China have been saying, you know, we can't afford to to uh, get rid of our retaliatory capability, our nuclear retaliatory capability. It's the only thing we have to keep you from hitting us first. So therefore, until we uh, create a new treaty, a Paros Treaty, to ban weapons in space, to ban these new systems, we can't afford to get rid of our nuclear weapons. So nuclear disarmament negotiations are on hold. They're at full stop because of the US moves to take control and domination of the planet and space above us. The other thing I wanna briefly uh, mention is mining the sky. It's clear to me that there's a link between the space force and mining the sky. And the reason why I believe that is this book, 
that was published by the Congress of the United States some years ago. Uh, it's called Military Space Forces, the Next 50 Years. And I just want to read one quote from this book. It talks about the Earth-Moon gravity well. Imagine a wishing well. Someone is down inside of the wishing well. They're trying to get out, and you're at the top of the well. They can't get out because you control the gravity well. You can, you're on top. And it's the same way, they say, with bases on the moon and with armed space stations on either side of the moon, the United States would be able to control who could get on and off the planet Earth. And so I believe one of the key jobs of this space force will be to create a military infrastructure to essentially control the front gate on and off the planet Earth. And in this book, they talk about this very thing. What if some other country or corporation or rich individual who is not authorized tries to go out and mine the sky? They say, quote, armed forces might lay in, white, uh, might lay in wait at that location to hijack rival shipments upon return. So we're talking piracy here. We're talking the U.S. developing the capability to literally control who can get on and off the planet Earth. Now, this is very destabilizing. It's very dangerous. It's very provocative. But that's what it's really all about. This return to the moon mission that we're hearing a lot about, they say will cost over $100 billion at a time when, look, we have a collapsing economy. So something here has to give. Some years ago, in one of the industry publications called Space News, they ran an editorial that said, look, we've got to be responsible corporate citizens. We've been saying for a long time that this whole space program will be the largest industrial project in the history of the planet Earth, necessitating massive funding. So we've got to be good corporate citizens and come up with a dedicated funding source to pay for it. And they say, we have. And we're now sending our lobbyists to Washington to secure that dedicated funding source. And in this article in Space News, they said it was the entitlement programs that officially in America are Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and what's left of the social safety net, which is completely in tatters. So this is why, if you listen closely, as the native people in this country said, put your ear to the railroad tracks and hear the train coming. If you listen closely, you hear these constant proposals to defund and cut uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, etc. So really, we have two trains on a collision course. One is the space warfare, uh, mining the sky program, and the other is human and environmental progress here on the planet Earth. We can't afford both of them. They're heading for a collision course. And so I say to people all the time, we're not asking you to drop what you're doing and you know, drop whatever issue you're working on and come work on space, but begin to integrate this into people's consciousness as you do your work. Talk about the money, talk about the cost, talk about the provocative nature about it, talk about the US refusal to create a, new treaty uh, to ban these weapons in space. One last thing I want to mention is space debris or space junk. Uh, some years ago, I think it was 1989, we held a protest at Cape Canaveral when I was working for the Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice. And we had an Apollo astronaut speak that day, Edgar Mitchell, one of the uh, moonwalkers. And he said, that if we ever had a war in space, one time, it would be one and only, because we would create so much space debris orbiting the Earth at 15,000 miles an hour, tiny, tiny pieces as small as a speck of paint and things much bigger. But so much debris would be created that soon it would create a cascading effect and the International Space Station and all the military and civilian satellites up in space would be crashing into each other, creating essentially, he said, a minefield 
around the planet Earth. Or he said, think of a piranha-laced river, and that we would not be able to get a rocket off the planet through that minefield, and that we would be literally entombed to the Earth forever. You also think about today's world when you're watching television, cable television, you're watching Netflix. How are you receiving that signal from satellites? What about your cell phone? What about your ATM banking, uh, traffic signals, uh, weather information? All comes from satellite technology. So if you start blowing everything up in space and creating this cascading effect there by having war in space, literally virtually everything on the earth shuts down. Almost everything goes black, goes dark. And so this is the mindset that these people at the Space Command and the Pentagon are working with. They know these things. Clearly they know it because they're tracking every day the satellites, the space station. They're moving them to other orbits to escape uh, uh, space junk that's coming dangerously close. So they're aware of it, but they continue on, continue on with all of these uh, crazy, expensive technology blunders. So this is our challenge, living in this moment of history that we're in, trying to find a way to deal with it. Let me just say, finally, every year in October, we have a week-long event we call Keep Space for Peace Week. Uh, local decentralized uh, protests, community events, educational events, film showings all across the world. This year, it'll be October 3rd through 10th. And so we ask people to consider uh, organizing something during Keep Space for Peace Week and help us expand the level of consciousness around the world. Here we have our friends in India working really hard to stop their country from moving into this program. They have 300 million poor people in India, living in dire poverty, and their country is now developing anti-satellite weapons. It's crazy. It doesn't make any sense. And it's the same story in many other countries, including here in the United States. So all of us have to try to find ways to help expand the public's consciousness that this space stuff isn't so fascinating and wonderful after all. I call it pyramids to the heavens. And we, the taxpayers, are the new slaves as these aerospace corporations and rich people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, they're the new pharaohs of our age. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being on the call today. Thank you very much, Bruce. So we've got quite a few questions come in now. Um, I'm going to put some of them together because some of them are more or less on the same subject. And there's a few on the mining uh, aspect. Um, our friend Leonid from Russia has, has said uh, the recent disturbing factor is Trump's claim to almost possess the moon for the USA. Is it a serious claim from the US president? Or can it be that the US government to start the transport to Earth, uh, the, the regolith that contains helium-3? And another related question to that is, um, what's, what do you use helium-3 for? I think you, you mentioned that, Linda. Maybe you could answer that. And how important is helium-3 uh, to uh, the, the, the corporations that might be using it? So do you want to start, Bruce, with just mentioning the general thing about mining and how that suddenly become a big thing? Oh, sorry, Linda. And then did you want me to respond about the... Yeah, after, let Bruce go first, then you okay. can respond. Yep. Sure. Well, let me say that right now they, they're, they're nearing the time where they can go out and mine the sky. After the taxpayers paid for all the many years of research and development to develop these technologies at NASA and at other agencies, and so now you've noticed in recent years, uh, they've begun privatizing a lot of these missions. During the Obama administration, they did that. Obama signed a law giving 
uh, wealthy individuals and American corporations the right to go out and mine the sky, which violates the intent, the language of the uh, Outer Space Treaty and the Moon Treaty that calls the celestial bodies the province of all humankind and says no individual, no country, no corporation can own them, can make land claims on them. But now that the taxpayers have paid all of the freight all these years, now they want to privatize it. And so they're nearing the time that they'll be able to go out and mine the sky. But one thing they say, a big problem, is in order to get to Mars, it takes a year. So they want to cut that time in half. And when you want to bring back uh, supplies to the Earth, you're going to need heavy lift launch power. And for those launches, they want to have nuclear reactors, rockets with nuclear reactors for engines. And they also anticipate having nuclear powered mining colonies on the moon and Mars and other celestial bodies. So the nuclear industry that has grown very unpopular here on the planet views space as a new market. And they're very excited about moving into space. This is very dangerous because we know that rockets uh, blow up on occasion. And if you have a release of plutonium or uranium from a launch accident, it could be very, very detrimental to the Earth below. There have been, as, as Dave mentioned in the beginning, there have been past accidents by both the United States and Russia where plutonium and uranium was released into the atmosphere. And it's been studied by scientists who believe that those accidents were major causes for the increase in cancer around the Earth today. So the one thing also to think about is when you're working at the Department of Energy laboratories at Los Alamos or at the Savannah River plant or other parts of the country that help create these space nuclear devices, they have a very bad record of contamination of workers, local water supplies, and the air. Just one example, when they launched Cassini in 1997 from from Florida, from the Kennedy Space Center, with 72 pounds of plutonium on board, uh, before they launched it, when they were uh, fabricating the generators, the plutonium generators in New Mexico, they had 244 cases of worker contamination. It was reported by the local newspaper in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So th this is a problem even before you launch these nuclear devices. Go ahead, Linda. Um, the helium that is supposedly on the moon is for hydrogen power. So that would be for powering moon bases. Um, the one, another big lie from the space mining industry is that any of these resources will be brought back to Earth. So the problem is it is so expensive that it is not feasible to return anything from asteroids or from Mars or any other space asset. So the truth of the matter is that they will do all space development and mining development is for space development. So the, it's a very long-term investment. And as Bruce said, the whole infrastructure and technology has been paid for by taxpayers. Um, and so it's these few private corporations that will profit from it because, so everything will be developed in situ or on the asteroid or on, you know, the um, planet because it costs just too much to bring it back home. And you got to figure like, well, what can they get there that's so valuable? Well, platinum, that's used for primarily, um, you know, digital devices, electronic devices, and gold and silver. And um, platinum is the one of the rarest elements on the planet. So, I mean, one thing that's really important to realize too is people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, they enjoy unbelievable incentives. They enjoy the lack of having to do environmental studies for whatever they want to build. So, um, for example, Starlink is this global satellite network um, Elon Musk and SpaceX is launching now. No environmental studies had to be do done. 
They are also given liability leniencies, and if there's an accident, they're not liable. That's the same thing with nuclear power and most launch systems. So they have this ridiculous amount of um, freedom from liability in the event of an accident. So, you know, these guys are going to profit. Oh, and then Elon's already working with the military. So that, that's the deal. They come off as these um, space cowboys who want to save the planet and the species and go into the future and develop space. But really, they want to control the market around the planet and enjoy tax breaks and incentives. And they're working with the military, allowing them to use their uh, systems. Um, so that's a, one of the problems. But uh, again, the big lie is that any of this is going to be brought back to Earth to help anybody on Earth. It's just, it's not. It's a ruse. It's a Trojan horse. So this idea like we're going to mine, it, it really, that's, it's a Trojan horse. There's nothing in the near future that's going to profit anyone from mining um, space. The main thing is the situational advantage militarily that they're trying to achieve. And I think it's really critical to look at the Moon Treaty. It needs to be strengthened. It has not been ratified by anybody. It's still a proposal, but the Moon Treaty says no one will own the Moon or a celestial object, and that it's a part of the um, commons, the global commons shared by everybody. So people will say like the era of treaties is over, but I don't think it is. I think we really need to motivate and advocate with our representatives to pursue nonviolent diplomatic responses to stop these new uh, areas of growth. You know, all of this is for profiteering, right? For the, it's all about, um, you know, corporate profiteering and uh, giving the, what, 30% increase to the shareholders. Um, so it's capitalism gone, you know, completely amok. So- okay. can, can we move on to a couple of other questions? Sorry, sure. there's quite, quite a few here. I mean, we've got a comment, actually, from Tamara Lawrence, who's... Uh, Hi, Tamara. She's on our, our board from Canada. And she said, just a comment, Bruce, good that you mentioned the International Space Station. The U.S. cooperates with Russia, Canada, Japan, and the U.S. in space. Let's remember that. We have to stop treating Russia as an enemy. I think we probably all agree with that. Um, yeah. There's, there's a question, too, about the... Now, this is from Michael Goodman. What's the role of the National Reconnaissance Office, the agency whose very existence was once a classified secret? Uh, I could just say a little bit about that. Yeah, the National Reconnaissance Office is, is also helps to run uh, Menwith Hill Station that I mentioned near us. Um, so uh, that's, uh, it's one of the five, I think there are five really top uh, inter um, Secure, security uh, intelligence gathering systems in, in the US, including the NSA, National Security Agency, um, the CIA, and uh, various others, defense intelligence charity um, um, uh, agency, and so on. And uh, it's the one that operates through space satellite systems, I believe. Uh, so I don't know if anybody else can add anything to that. Um, Anybody want to say anything on that? Otherwise, we'll carry on. There's another question here from Dennis Doherty uh, in Australia. Hi, Dennis. The author of a book on Pine Gap, he says a former US citizen, Rosenberg, when asked how he justified his work when it contributed to the death of many in the, in the first Iraq war, his answer was that we, we just get the info and hand it on to the military. What do you think of this type of reasoning? We hear that quite a lot. I'm just doing my job. It's, you know, I'm just handing some information over to somebody else. Um, anybody want to comment on that? I can comment on it. Um, just that I was in a similar position. I did work for a time for the Ministry of Defence uh, and got to realise that some of the things I was doing was not to my liking, I guess. Some of the arguments that were being used were being used in order to create more weapons production rather than more diplomatic processes. And um, I don't think that's, that's the right, that was the right thing to do. So I left and lots of other people have left uh, once they found out these things. There have been lots, a number of whistleblowers, um, some famous ones and some not so famous ones who have who actually ex tried to expose some of the things that goes on 
in uh, in the military or or in um, in, in political circles, and um, it's thanks to them that we know. It's thanks to Snowden, for example, we know so much more now about the intelligence gathering operations of the U.S. and on what that's all means. So uh, some people do have. A, th a thought that maybe you know i don't want to be part of this i don't want to be part of that anymore and the fact that others don't think that way means that it can carry on so uh, more power to the ones who opt out of that system dave uh, th there's a question here i'd like to take it says uh what about russia's hypersonic missiles untraceable multiple warheads uh, i'd like to comment on that you know, Russia and China have both uh, renounced first strike attack strategy. The United States refuses to renounce it. The U.S. and all American politicians always say uh, we can't take anything off the table. You know, we have to leave all strategies on the table. So the United States is, as we said earlier, surrounding Russia and China with uh, missile defense systems that are key elements in first strike attack planning. Let me just tell this short story. Every year at the Space Command, they have a computer war game where they practice an attack on Russia and China. They call it the red team versus the blue team. And in that computer war game, the US tries to take out all of Russian and Chinese nuclear forces, whether they're under the ocean in submarines, whether they're on the land, whether they're on bombers, they try to take out as many as possible in a first strike. And then when Russia or China inevitably would launch any retaliatory capability, the missile defense shield would then be used to theoretically uh, take out the remaining attack, uh, the, the retaliatory attack. And the reason why Russia then is developing these hypersonic weapon systems, and they've said this very clearly, is largely because of missile defense. It, it's like in World War II, you know, France created the Maginot Line to stop uh, Hitler from bringing his tanks into France, and Hitler just went around it, went around the Maginot Line uh, to uh, invade uh, France. And so Russia is developing, or has developed then, these hypersonic missiles that would essentially be able to get around, go around the missile defense systems to circumvent them and to be able to hit the U.S. in a retaliatory strike. So <clears throat> for decades, China and Russia have been proposing treaties in the United Nations to prevent an arms race in space and every time the United States, you know, trashes it. So, and meanwhile, beefs up missile defense all around, you know, in Europe, Poland, Turkey, and in South Korea, all over the Pacific, the Pacific pivot. So we have exacerbated the development of hypersonics. I mean, you can be sure United States has been working on hypersonics as long as everybody else, but it's been this non-ending, uh, ever building arms race and hypersonics is just the next level. So there should be a hypersonic test ban. There should be a hyper, I mean, we should just not pursue this technology by um, trying to get a Paros or some treaty in, in place. And that's, I mean, we have to keep that context because people demonize all the time. Like, you know, if you listen to the military industrial complex and the military and the Pentagon people, which I do all the time, they constantly say like, we're losing the race against hypersonics with Russia and China, but it's a race we created. So, and they know that. So um, we have, I don't know what, I really think at some point we have to talk about the psychosis and the psychological madness of uh, always thinking we can solve our problems by perpetuating warfare for war profiteering by these aerospace corporations. But it's even beyond that. It's a kind of sickness of, you know, always trying to beat one out by having a new technology. And so when is it gonna end? So we need to have some kind of Paros or test ban for hypersonics to stop this escalation because it'll never end until we destroy ourselves ultimately. 
Uh, hey, Dave, do you think we could ask uh, Aruna Camilla, our board member in India, to come on and say a few words about her conference, uh, Space Law Conference she organized last October? Sure. Um, Aruna, could you, could you raise your hand, please, so yes. that Matt can open you up? There you go. Can you unmute, unmute Aruna? Unmute Matt? Aruna, Dave. I mean, Matt. I can't do it, but Matt will. Are you there, Aruna? Can't, can't see her now. Uh, no. you do, oh yeah, while you're trying to do that, just want to say that Mary Beth just said, take the money away from these sociopaths. And we always, I mean, what could we be spending this money on? Conversion is so important. And Mary Beth, of course, is an expert on that, that we're wasting our resources and we could be building infrastructure for a green economy rather than giving the money to the psychopaths. Right, right on. How about uh, Tamara? Uh, Tamara Lorenz, another one of our yeah. board members from Canada. Uh, Tamara, you still on? Can you raise your hand? And Matt, could you uh, let her on? There she is. Yay. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, Tamara. <laughs> Hi, Hi, everyone. How are you? Thank you very much for organizing this important web webinar talking about how we can stop uh, this increasing militarization and weaponization of space and how we really need to collaborate internationally um, to promote peace and disarmament. It's nice to see you all. Hi. Any luck, uh, Matt, with uh, Aruna from India? If oh, not, no longer on, Bruce. If, if not, how about Hannah Middleton, our board member in Australia, and Lindis Percy, our board member in, uh, in, in the UK? How about either of them uh, coming on? And, uh, I'm afraid Lindis is joining us on Facebook. Um, so she can't um, she can't add anything. Although she did ask a question in the in the Q and A, which okay. she can have a little look at. And Hannah doesn't seem to be on, I'm afraid. Oh, okay, all right. No, it's, it's Dennis who's on, not Hannah. Uh, Bruce and Dave, uh, could we also mention? I see that Colin Archer just announced this in the chat that right now it's the global campaign against military spending and there are actions around the world. This uh, international campaign is being led by the International Peace Bureau. I encourage people to go to the website. There are some great online uh, resources and tools. They've produced a terrific graphic that shows, uh, it, it's a comparison of healthcare uh, needs versus uh, military spending, healthcare versus warfare, and I just encourage people to post it on their social media feeds, Facebook and Twitter, and start promoting this idea of reducing military spending and reallocating it, it to our urgent uh, healthcare needs and environmental needs and social needs, and start raising awareness about the poss serious possibility of conversion, because I think that this pandemic presents an opportunity for us to have these conversations with new constituencies, with new allies, and to start really promoting a conversion and disarmament right now. Thank you, Tamara. Uh, may I have Aruna? Oh, good. Oh, there she is. Hey, Aruna. Hello. We can't, we can't hear you. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Might not have a mic. Oh. I think she's holding a mic, but it's not working. Um, is, she, think, well, she's, is she speaking now? Yeah, can't hear though. 
Arundhati Roy was talking yesterday on Democracy Now about. Hang on, hang on, Linda. Let's let's see. Hopefully, it's just a setting. Let's give her a chance here. Again, let me just tell people that last October I went to Visakhapatnam, India on the Bengal Sea and Aruna organized, she's a law professor and she organized a, a national, international uh, space conference, space law conference and had students come from more than 20 law schools across India to talk about various aspects of space law. It was a brilliant event. I hope we can hear from you. Uh, it doesn't look like we can. Uh, we have a, also Dennis Doherty on the line here. Maybe we could, he had a question that perhaps he could ask. He's from Australia. Can you hear us, yeah. Dennis? Yep. Could you go ahead with your question? Oh, there we are. There uh, are. I've, um, can you hear me? Yep. This is uh, uh, Hannah's on the line. So, oh, there's oh. Hannah. Hello, Hi. everybody. Hi. Um, we wanted to say just a couple of things quickly, if that's okay. Um, I think you probably all know that Australia frequently trots on behind whatever America wants. There's a very close alliance. And we now have a space agency. And most of what it appears to be planning looks like it's going to be military. Um, it's really going to be properly launched in August. And it was intended that we would ha develop some major protests. Uh, because of the pandemic, that's uh, a lot more problematical at the moment. And it's not clear what we should undertake. We might say that the pandemic has produced two small victories for us. The US Marines are no longer coming to Darwin this year and exercise pitch black in the north has been cancelled. So some of the war games and military stationing of US troops in Australia um, has been undermined. And of course, one of the things we're looking at and discussing amongst ourselves is, you know, what are the ways in which we might be able to publicize that more and make it permanent? Good. <laughs> I think Den Dennis had a, oh, that was the, um, I, I read out Dennis's question. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Dennis's question was about Pine you know, Gap. It relates to Pine Gap, which is an ongoing problem Could you for us in this word, country. Uh, Hannah, just say a word uh, for people. Tell them what Pine Gap actually is. <sighs> Yeah, it has many functions. Pine Gap is a large uh, military facility just outside Alice Springs, right in what's called the dead center of Australia. Very difficult to reach, uh, actually, if you want to protest. It is an intelligence gathering base, a targeting base. It controls drones. Um, it, it's a war fighting surveillance drone controlling base owned by the Americans and run by the US military. Um, there are some Australian personnel there and our government talks about it as a joint facility, but it's not. It's a US facility. Is that enough, Bruce? That's good. Thank you. Oh, uh, uh, Hang on, Dennis. Wants I'll just make a comment. The um, with Pine Gap has uh, about five hundred to six hundred uh, U.S. citizens working there, and they're in the middle of what's called in Australia the territory, which is uh, very strongly 
uh, Indigenous and the uh, health authorities in Australia are very concerned that the virus not getting among uh, Indigenous communities in the Northern Territory, yet the Australian government uh, has just in actually today, I got a letter from an official in the Defence Department saying they will allow the United States personnel to come in and out of uh, Pine Gap and uh, on a case by case basis. And uh, this is uh, potentially a, a risk uh, that they're putting Australians under mm. just for the sake of you know, their surveillance base, which is um, quite annoying and uh, quite uh, something we've been protesting about for years now, but uh, the, the struggle goes on. All right, good to see you guys. Thank you for being on. It's like four o'clock in the morning your time, isn't it? That's yeah. right. <laughs> All right. Take good care. Thank you for being on with us. Let's try Aruna again, Dave. Let's see if we can hear anything from Aruna now. Yeah, that would be good. No, nothing. Sorry, we can't hear you, Aruna. Oh, st still can't hear you. We'll do another, we'll have to do another one with you involved this time. Next time, rather. Still can't hear you. Hi there. Sorry. I've sent, I've sent you a few messages on the, on the chat about how to turn your microphone on. Um, if you, it's just, if you click on the little arrow next to the microphone in the bottom left corner, you should be able to see um, a way to turn your mic on. It is, according to the uh, information we get on the panel, it is on, but we're not getting anything through. It's unmuted. Okay, well, m maybe we... Keep, keep messing around with it, Aruna. We'll keep, go trying, to keep, trying. <laughs> keep trying, keep trying. Keep mm. trying, keep uh, trying. Who else do we have? Uh, any other Global Network board members? If, you, if, or if you're out there, please raise your hand so Matt can see you. Well, we don't want just board members, I think. We want um, people to ask questions uh, okay. and, get, and get involved if they can. Um, there is a question from Lindis uh, that she asked on Facebook. She was saying, I, I, Menmouth Hill, she's asking about Menmouth Hill, which is basically the British equivalent of Pine Gap, I guess. It's the mm -hmm. same kind of establishment. Um, intelligence gathering, they feed intelligence information to, apart from other things, drone operations and, and such like. Um, so her question is, we, we presume that Menmouth Hill is involved in the Space Force um, business uh, or will be involved. We have no proof that it will. Do, do any of you have any information to confirm this? I, I think it's probably similar to what I was trying to say in my introduction that it, Menmouth is part of the intelligence, global intelligence gathering system of the United States. And so whether it's directly connected with Space Force or not, it will certainly be a um, giving them information or, uh, that they will be using for other things. Um, it's not clear to me what Space Force will involve. Do either Linda or, or Bruce know how many? I know they're bringing in lots of different uh, groups from the different uh, other services, but it's not clear whether uh, the intelligence services will be part of Space Force too. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. <clears throat> no, okay. We, we just have to keep our eyes and ears open, I guess. Mm. Um, there's a, a, some more questions about the mining. Um, one was that uh, the USA declared that they want international collaboration regarding the mining. This is mentioned in the executive order just signed by Trump. How can this declaration be registered by the international community while at the same time the US declares that it does not see space as a global commons? That's from Agatha Wislocker. Uh, 
any comment on that? Do you have any reaction to that? How about you, Linda? You want to say anything about that? Mm. No. I mean, yeah, uh, I think that's um, United States exceptionalism that we're entitled to anything we want. And um, we need to get Trump out of the White House as soon as humanly possible. Okay. I'm trying to scroll through all these questions here. And, uh, uh, Tamara has said something in the chat. Would you just repeat what you've said, Tamara, about the F-35s and Earth Day? Are you still there? Uh, yes, I am. So, um, last July, the Canadian government launched a competition to buy a new fleet of fighter jets for the Canadian Air Force. And the bid is for $19 billion for 88 new fighter aircraft. This doesn't include the costs, the full life cycle costs, uh, maintenance and operation and uh, the weapon systems. Um, and the Canadian government just announced that it's going to uh, delay by three months the time that the companies can submit their bids. So they were supposed to submit it uh, last month, but they're going to delay it for three months. So there's three companies that are in the running, Boeing with its Super Hornets, uh, Saab, uh, the Swedish company Saab with its uh, Griffin um, air combat aircraft, and then of course Lockheed Martin with the F-35. And Lockheed Martin has been putting a lot, a lot of money in Canada for the past 10 years to try to get the Canadian government to choose the F-35s. I was in Ottawa, the capital, uh, in February, and Lockheed Martin was running an advertising campaign throughout the city on bus stops all over uh, the city that, ha that had a picture of the F-35, and it said, uh, one pilot, thousands of jobs. So they're, they have this intense campaign to get Canada to choose uh, their fighter aircraft. And so mm -hmm. I have uh, worked with other peace activists across the country for the past 10 years to try to delay or stop this purchase, but it's been really ramping up in this country for the past year. So on Earth Day uh, next week, um, which is next Wednesday, I'm going to launch a, a campaign to disarm the skies, to uh, stop the purchase of the F-35, uh, stop the purchase of the um, fighter aircraft. And I'm hoping that other Canadians will join me and uh, we can put pressure on the government and all of the politicians to say, you know, we just cannot af afford this. We can't do it because uh, uh, we need these resources for social and environmental needs. And also fighter aircrafts are so terrible. Um, they exacerbate the climate crisis. I just wrote a piece in uh, a Peace magazine in Canada. I'll send the link to it. Actually, I, I compare the situation in Canada with the situation in Australia and the United States around fighter aircraft and particularly the F-35, the, um, mm -hmm. the economic and the climate impacts, and I'll share the link to it. But um, I'm just going to uh, do my best to try to to stop this purchase and any kind of support that you can give any resources that would be really great um just one other thing to say is that the f-35 as many of you know is a global weapon system and right now during this pandemic the f-35 production plants in japan italy and the united states are at full tilt so they are continuing to produce these fighter aircraft when you know there's a desperate need for medical supplies and 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 uh, and health services and we're wasting mm. money right at this time um on on building a fighter you? aircraft so uh, we have we have we have to stop stop these weapon systems and press yeah. for conversion of course thank, thank you yeah i can just add as well that britain has bought 138 of these f-35s too so it's a, it's a problem around the world. I mean, it's one of the things that Bruce was saying. I think it's the U.S. building up their weapon system to export to other countries, exporting it all over. Um, I think we're going to have to uh, finish pretty soon. We've done nearly an hour and a half. Um, and I wanted to say a few things before we finish. Uh, in particular, um, there's another poll we wanted to 
ask people to fill in. Maybe uh, you could put that one up now, Matt, somewhere. Um, so uh, if all this information, it will be useful for us to determine what to, what to do next. So please um, uh, fill this one in about any possibilities for action you might like to get or could get involved in. There's a lot you can do, even uh, if you can't leave the house or wherever you are. So please keep, uh, keep filling this stuff in. Um, uh, would, it, would it be possible if we could see the results of the first two poll questions earlier? Yeah, I I just can we do that, that Matt? Run, and then I will, I'll do that. Yeah, okay. I wish we could click more than one for action possibilities. You can only so, click. So greedy, Linda. I want to <laughs> click it all. I want to click it all. I want to do the, the whole thing. Okay, um, so while you're doing all that, just let me thank uh, everybody for joining in. Thanks to everyone who said something or sent questions or just listened. And thanks to the panelists, of course, Bruce and, and Linda. And, Let's just keep going. We, we've got to beat this thing somehow, as Carl said, uh, and it's really going to be up to us. Um, I'd also like to thank Matt from Yorkshire CND, who's, CND, who's set this whole thing up and kept an eye on us all the way through, kept us going. Thanks, Matt. Thanks a lot. Um, we're looking f to produce further webinars, as I say, so watch out for further news on that. And um, keep, one question. If you want to see all this again you can, can i ask you a question first please sorry where can people find this video i was just about to say that okay uh, good you want to see the video well matt you say you t you say yes yeah, so the video has been live streamed on facebook at the moment uh, we'll send it out we'll send the link out to uh, all the participants on here and it'll also be shared on facebook sorry on uh, you. youtube <laughs> Thanks. okay Great. So let's keep going. And don't forget, you can join the Global Network or Yorkshire CND or both or, and, and everything else. And uh, let's keep this campaign going. So thanks again and um, stay well and bye for now. Bye. Bye. Hey, everybody. I'm going to play my song now if I can find it. Wait. Oh my God. Never mind. <laughs> okay, I'm going. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you, Matt. Bye, Aruna. Yeah, thanks Sorry a lot. Sorry, didn't work out. Next time. Yeah. Here we go. Heaven, war in heaven. Gonna build a missile shield in outer space to protect us from evil rogue states. Even if it starts a new high tech on race. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.